You know, yeah. people say to me, oh, when you learn a you learn your, uh, your aria and you learn, I started page one. And I started at page one 40 years ago when I started. Uh, Mrs. Gurevich not only had me translate, but she had me translate word for word, and that was not easy. I didn't have Nico Castell's books, and God bless him, because I mean, the more we have available, I didn't have the internet. God bless it, because the more you have, the better it is. Um, you had to go and sit down with a dictionary and try to figure out which meaning and uh, how, you know, what, how is that verb conjugated? Is, uh, what, what does that mean in, in, in this idiom? You know, what, what is the, um, all the, all the various things that one must learn about a language. In the end, I just learned a lot about the language itself. Um, but not only did she make me, she, uh, make me translate word for word, but everybody's part. Because she said, well how, well, how are you, what did they say to you? You're standing there just looking at me. What, did, what am I saying to you? And sure enough, <laughs> you know, when I went to the Met and I would say something expressive to a colleague and they'd look at me like, duh, I thought, well, your teacher didn't tell you, ask you that question for sure. You know, and on the other hand, we sometimes we learned through stage directors that have helped us with, with experience, but some of us would have gotten there faster had we known before. I'm not trying to say that a beautiful voice isn't a beautiful voice and doesn't have its value, but it's not enough. You have, there are many other requirements, many other requirements. Um, you know, you say you, I remember going to rehearsals um, with Placido and, and, and Nello Santi and sitting down and reading through other scores and I couldn't sight read the way he could. I mean, he can sit down and just read anything. And, uh, and Placido would sit there, play it, read it, and Nello Santi would sing the other parts. You know, so that we would be, and we would be talking about it and acting it out. This was a rehearsal and this was in the basement of the Zurich Opera. You know, um, and we had fun with our work. It was not just work, but we lived with it and, and enjoyed it. it, it uh, I, I wish people wouldn't think that it's a job, or it's a, it is a job, but it's a great job. <laughs> it, it's a job that I, I, that I don't mind 23 hours a day. And if you don't feel that way about it, don't bother go into it. Because you really have to be prepared to do that kind of pressure living. And it's worth it. Now, if I had a fairy godmother who would just give me any amount of money, oh boy. But the problem is I don't know of any one person that could do all the things I'd like to do with them and to them to, in order to have the career, because it would be a, a full-time job for several years, which perhaps the old singers did that. Perhaps they gave full days to working on their voices. We don't have that luxury. We don't have stage directors walking behind us before every appearance saying, now you make this gesture, now you make that gesture. Some of us, by the, by the seat of our pants, get through performances. And I'd like to see that changed. I'd like to see young people not go by the seat of their pants, but because they know who that person is and they, can, they know why that person moved. And whether it's left or right, or whether it's right or wrong, they, the movement must be, must be made because it must be. And for me, that's an extremely important part of growing as an artist. It's what makes the difference between a good singer and an artist. Uh, it's where I wish I could have gone further had I had a little more time. Uh, but everybody has their day. And I had a great 15 minutes, so no complaints. When Isaac Stern would come in to a Carnegie Hall meeting, he would take his uh, violin, put it in a case, closed the case and put it away and it was safe until he picked it up to play again. If I go to the ladies room, I take my instrument with me. If it rains, it's my instrument that knows it. His instrument is carefully packed and safe and kept from being wet. Mine gets wet, catches colds, um, uh, cries when there's something unhappy going on in life. It affects that same instrument. Every young artist has to deal with that. Uh, when I was younger and didn't know it, I'd go to a game at, at Hunter College and scream my head off and go to a voice lesson. And, uh, and of course, Mrs. Gravich hit the ceiling.
because she didn't feel a serious artist was, that would behave that way. But I wasn't a serious artist. I was a young college girl who also wanted to be with her friends. You know, the, then that comes a moment when you start realizing what you want to be and doing what you have to do to be that. Um, I never gave up enjoying uh, having parties and being with friends, to be honest. But I know singers that uh, protect their instruments by not talking all day of a performance. If someone uh, ever know, finds out that I didn't talk the day of a performance, they'd bury me because they know I had died. Um, you know, you have to find what is the best way of living uh, lifestyle for you that allows you to do what you have to do, do it well, and still keep the things that, it, that you find important to you. Sometimes we exaggerate and sometimes we go in the wrong direction. Uh, because we're, most of us are not nuns and, and priests. Uh, but that's, that's a, something you learn through living, what you need to do. Some people need to sleep um, the night of a performance until 12 o'clock in the day. Uh, some people, c if they wake up in the morning at 9, cannot eat anything until they've sung. If you don't feed me, I'm not going to sing. Now, someone else will be shocked by that and say, how can you eat and go on stage? It's very simple. If my stomach is empty, you might as well not send me on stage. But I'm not saying that just to say you've got to find out your own needs and live by them. I, I can sleep in the afternoon of a performance and get up and go to the performance. I'll get up at a certain time. My secretary always said, and when she gets up, don't get in her way. Once she's had her afternoon nap, let her be. <laughs> Meaning I'll eat, do what I dress, and get ready, and I'm ready, and my mindset is for the performance. Um, I, if I had to sit up from 9.30 in the morning and wait for a performance at 8 o'clock at night, I'd be a personal wreck. But that's only my problem. Someone else, I'm told, I don't know whether Nikolai should buy his, from him, but I heard that Nikolai Geta didn't eat anything after a certain hour during the day um, and until after the performance. That was the, he sang gorgeously, so it couldn't be wrong. You know, for him, it certainly wasn't wrong. It's, it's, all of that is a learning process. All of that is part of what we do over the years while we go from student to apprentice to performer to hopefully star. You know, when you've been singing for 35 years, you've sung with many conductors, many types of conductors. I can't remember one that never gave something. I remember those that gave so much. And sometimes I remember particular conductors in particular performances, like um, Leonard Bernstein, the night we did the Verdi Requiem in St. Paul's in London, in the cathedral. I think every emotion was on his face that night in his body. And I don't know. Uh, all I know is we were all together and we were an ensemble and we sang like an ensemble and we became a well-known Verdi uh, Requiem performance. But it came from, I think it started with him. I think that he was the one who caused us all to, to, to drink in this, this immense feeling he had for that piece. Um, I've, not, I've not had poor experiences with conductors, luckily. Um, I know that they, I've been told that certain conductors like Carl Byrne was very, very difficult. Yes, he Bob was difficult, but he, he had a, a, a level. He wanted a certain type of work to be done a certain way, and, uh, and he believed him in, in himself, and you, and you had to go along with it. He did treat some of the artists when we were recording the, Verdi, uh, the Don Giovanni. He could be a little tough on with some of the artists and bring them to tears. <laughs> um, but uh, that also depends on your personality. It's very hard to make me cry. If a dog is hurt in a movie, I'll cry my heart out. But um, the conductor, I'll look in the face and just wait until he calms down. How do you teach someone charisma? You don't. You know, if you've got it, you can make all kinds of mistakes and people will forgive you. If you don't have it, you'd better sing well. Right. Isn't that sad? I mean, I've seen Corelli come on stage and crap up a performance. I mean, crap it up. And there's somehow nothing, his animal magnetism was so enormous. 
Well, it wasn't for me because I was standing next to him and I had to put up with his mistakes and being kicked around on stage. But, yeah, but uh, truthfully, yes. Yeah, I, the first time I saw him in Andrea Chenier, it was in Vienna in about 19, could it have been 59? Yeah, it must have been when I was like, just, going, just going out to audition. And he walked on stage in that silver suit with the silver hair and he just stood there. And I f flipped out. And when he began to sing, and this whole thing came together, and Tibaldi at her best, and Ettore Bastianini at his best. I screamed for about 20 minutes at the end and had to cancel my audition for Foncaria because I was hoarse the next day. I, it wasn't funny at all. They had paid my fare from, Vienna, from Zurich, and I couldn't think I had screamed the night before. I screamed my voice out. And when he walked on stage and sang his first note, it was like, Boom. <laughs>